Hi everyone, this is Lesson 5, Volcanoes and Volcanic Hazards. So this is Chapter 5, um, so we'll go ahead and get started. So we're going to talk about volcanic eruptions. So first, just a little bit of review. So we're going to talk about what compositions are. So what are some of the compositions that we learned in igneous rocks? So we'll start at one end of the spectrum. We had felsic, intermediate, mafic, and we held ultramafic, right? All right. So some factors that determine the violence of a volcanic eruption are the composition, the temperature, and the dissolved gases in the magma. So fluidal basaltic lavas um, are generally very quiet. While highly viscous magmas produce very explosive eruptions. So, um, in this image right here, oh, we'll go back. We'll go ahead and grab the pin. Um, right here, that is going to be highly viscous with an explosive eruption. Well, this is a very quiet eruption. So, viscosity of magma. So, viscosity is a measure of a material's resistance to flow. So some factors that affect viscosity are the temperature. So hotter magmas are less viscous, which means they flow more. Composition, um, and by composition we mean silica content. So high silica, high viscosity, which means it doesn't flow. Low silica, more fluidal, so that's mafic lavas dissolved gases. So gas content affects the magma's mobility. So gases expand near the surface and are extruded. Um, the violence of eruption is related to how easily the gases can escape. So when we're talking about being more resistant to flow, um, the more resistant to flow is going to be an example of honey, while less resistant to flow is going to be water. So for two examples, we have a quiet volcano of Hawaii, and we have an explosive one of Mount St. Helens. Which one of those would you expect to be felsic? Mount St. Helens, right? It has more of an explosive volcanic activity. Um, why are felsic volcano eruptions more dangerous? Because it has more of these dissolved gases and it builds in and it has larger explosions. So if we look down here at our compositions from basaltic, um, intermediate, and our rhyolitic is our felsic, um, you can see how the percent of silica changes, how our gas content changes, and how the temperature changes. Alright, so extruded material. So these would be what we would consider our extrusive types of racks. So we're going to talk about different types of lava flows. So the first one is super fun to say. It is pohoi hoi lava and it resembles braids and ropes. So again, pronounced pohoi hoi. Um, it's hotter, more fluidal than what we call ah uh, ah uh, lavas. So pohoi hoi lavas um, flows develop into ah uh, ah uh, lava, but you can't have it the other way around. Um, they can create lava tubes, which are cave-like tunnels that are conduits that carry lava. Now our next type of lava is what we could um, consider ah uh, ah, uh, and these are jagged blocks. Now the easiest way to tell the difference between pohoi hoi and ah uh, ah uh, is because ah uh, ah uh is going to be so rough that if you were to touch it, it is going to be jagged and it's going to rip your hand up. So if you touch it, it's like ah uh, ah, uh, like it hurts or pohoi hoi is not like that at all. Next we have block lava, which are viscous and acidic to rhyolitic lavas. And they're short, thick flows that look similar to our ah-ah, but the blocks have smoother surfaces. 
Then we have pillow lavas, which form along oceanic lava flows. So what's happening is that as the lava is coming up um, on the oceanic floor, it creates this little bulb, and it starts to cool all around it. Now, it's eventually going to break through one side, it creates another bulb. Um, and that's what we see down here in this image. So we have all these little pillows of lava. Alright, talking about some of our extruded materials, we'll first talk about gases. So gases make up about 1-6% to 6 of a magma's total weight, but thousands of tons of gases can be emitted daily. Now the type of gases emitted varies from place to place. Most common are water vapor, carbon dioxide, sulfur dioxide, chlorine, and fluorine. Um, and in this image over here, we also have some nitrogen that's being released. So what is the role of gases in an eruption? It adds that mobility. It helps the lava and the magma move, um, and it can create more explosive eruptions. All right, so more extruded materials are our pyroclastics. So we have our fire fragments. That's what's meant by pyroclastics. Um, there's different types of pyroclastic material. We have ash and dust, which is fine glassy fragments. Pumice from frothy lava. Lapilli, which are walnut sized. Cinders, which are a little smaller um, pea sized. And then particles larger than lapilli are blocks and bombs. So blocks are hardened lava, bombs are ejected as hot lava, and those are generally larger than 2.5 inches. So next we just have some general um, looks about a volcano, so some of our general features. We have an opening at the summit, which is what we call a crater, um, or a caldera. So a steep old depression at the summit, or a caldera, which is a summit depression that is greater than one kilometer in diameter. We also have a vent, which is connected to the magma chamber via pipe. We also have a side vent, or a parasitic cone. We have Again, we have the vent, we have our crater in this case, we have the lava, which is on the outside, we have a lava flow, we have our magma chamber, because it's inside the earth, and then we have a pipe that is feeding all of it. Alright, so we're going to talk about our different types of volcanoes. First, we have cinder cones aka scoria cones. So these are built from ejected lava fragments. The size ranges um, from ash to bombs that are just about one meter in size. Um, typically these are basaltic compositions. They have very steep angles. They're rather small. They normally occur in groups or little clusters and most form in less than one month. So 95% form in less than one year. So these form very quickly. So you can see examples of these in Arizona and in Mexico. So when we talk about size and some of the other key components of our different types of volcanoes, take into consideration the amount of time it takes these to form. Next are shield volcanoes. These are broad, large domes that actually look like a shield, primarily made up of basaltic lava, generally large, and they produce a large volume of magma or lava, and most begin on the ocean floor and grow large enough to form volcanic islands. So examples of these are the Canary Islands, Hawaiian Islands, Galapagos, Easter Island, um, a place in Africa, and Newberry in Oregon. Our next type of volcano is a composite. 
So composite or our stratovolcano. So these are the most picturesque when we think of them. Um, most are adjacent to the Pacific Ocean, which is what we refer to as the Ring of Fire. These are typically large in size. They're symmetrical, conical, created by ash and cinders that are interbedded with different lava flows and pyroclastics. The shape is all a function of the viscosity of lava, which is typically more silica-rich and acidic. So if we have steep angles and we have lava that's not flowing down, it's going to add to that and it's going to create steeper sides. These have the most violent type of activity. They often produce Nue Ardents and most produce Lahars, which are a type of volcanic mud flow. So some examples of these are the Andes in South America, the Cascades in America, in Canada, and Mount St. Helen. All right, so if we're comparing sizes of our volcanoes, a is a shield volcano um, in Hawaii. B is Mount Rainier, a composite cone. And C is one of our little cinder cones down in Arizona. So you can just see how big the differences are. Now there's a little video that you can watch down at the bottom in animation that goes through some different comparisons of our volcanoes. So some of our other volcanic landforms that we should know. The first we have calderas. So remember those are at the summit where we have an opening that's greater than one kilometer in size. So these are steep wall depressions at the summit. Um, and we have different types of calderas. We have crater lake type, Hawaiian type, and Yellowstone type. So other types of volcanic landforms, we're going to talk about fissure eruptions and lava plateaus. So fluid basaltic lava is extruded from crustal fractures, which are called fissures, and it produces flood basalts. So Columbia Plateau and the Columbia River flood basalts. Now we have volcanic necks and pipes. So pipes are short conduits that connect a magma chamber to the surface and a volcanic neck are resistant vents left standing after the erosion has removed the volcanic cone. So this is an example of what you see in Shiprock, New Mexico. All right, so getting to probably one of the more favorite parts are talking about volcanic hazards. So in the past 10,000 years, at least 1,500 volcanoes have erupted at least once. It is estimated that over 500 million people throughout the world live near an active volcano. All of those people are susceptible to a variety of different volcanic hazards. All right, so let's get into the meat of our different types of hazards. First are pyroclastic flows. These are hot gases that are infused with hot molten ash and larger fragments. These move at a pretty rapid speed of 60 miles an hour. So they're typically broken into two parts. There's a low density cloud of expanding gases with ash, and we have a ground hugging portion that's mostly vesicular material. So gas is escaping from that as well. Um, to better understand the force and destruction behind pyroclastic flows, check out the YouTube video. It is really impressive. So you can see that cloud and you can see this tiny little vehicle trying to escape it. Um, but check out the YouTube video. It's really impressive. Next are lahars. So these are mud flows that contain volcanic debris and water. These travel at speeds of 30 kilometers an hour or 20 miles an hour. And volcanoes do not need to erupt to trigger a lahar. So a lot of people want to know where the water comes from when we talk about lahars. Well, think of our cascades um, here in America and up through Canada. Most of them are snow-capped. 
So as the lava or magma is approaching the surface, it's heating that up, it's starting to melt it, it's gonna mix with that debris and it creates an out of control mud flow. Um, so that link shows a really good example of what a lahar looks like. So next are tsunamis. Um, tsunamis are related, we have volcano and then we have some earthquake related ones. Um, related to tsunamis that are usually caused by a strong earthquake due to a volcanic eruption. Um, so if you will watch that video, um, it's a link to historic volcanic related tsunamis just showing you the size and the expanse of what they would look like. All right, so next are volcanic hazards. We have volcanic ash. Um, over 80 plus commercial flights are damaged by flying through clouds of volcanic ash each year. Now, um, with all the volcanoes in Iceland erupting, this has been more in the news now than what it has been lately. Um, so this diagram just shows different hazards to aviation from volcanic clouds and all of the different things that it can affect. Next we have volcanic gases. So volcanic gases can affect your respiratory health because it can release poisonous gases that kill people and animals. Now it does have some effects on the weather, so sulfur dioxide can combine with water vapor in the upper atmosphere. This combination actually reflects sunlight, causing earth to cool. Um, so I've given an example of Mount Pinatubo um, and the sulfur dioxide. So you can see that it was over 10 parts per billion, which doesn't seem like a lot, but it was elevated. And it created the stream, and it was carried by the jet stream, and it reflected sunlight, and it caused a cooling effect right through that portion. Um, so pretty impressive. All right, so plate tectonics in our igneous activity. So the global distribution of igneous activity is not random. So most volcanoes are gonna be located along the margins of our ocean basins. Um, and some other general locations include our deep ocean basins and our interiors of our continents. So plate motions provide the mechanism by which mantle rocks melt and that generates our magma. So igneous activity at convergent plate boundaries. So this is a pretty common plate boundary where we're gonna get um, volcanic eruptions. So oceanic crust descends into the mantle. So remember, it is denser, so it's going down. Um, as it's going down, it reaches the mantle. It is going to start to melt. Um, and as it's melting, magma will slowly rise up. Um, it can form volcanic island arcs in the ocean, or it can produce continental volcanic arcs um, in the continent. So most activity is associated with the rim of the Pacific Basin, which is called the Ring of Fire. So this is a diagram that shows active volcanoes along the Ring of Fire. Um, and you can see that there's quite a few of them on there. So a lot of these are going to be at convergent plate boundaries between oceanic and continental plates. Um, and again, for the Ring of Fire, we're talking about this red outlined section that we see all through here. All right, so talking about the ring of fire and economic minerals, um, so we have a porphyry copper, copper type deposit. Remember, porphyry rocks have two different size of mineral grains. We have the aphanitic and then we have the phaneritic. So it creates phenocrist and ground mass. Um, and then we can get copper and gold we can get the same with just copper, and then we can get epithermal, 
which can have silver, it can have gold, and you can just see how those different volcanic places can be related to important economic minerals. All right. So we also are going to get igneous activity at divergent plate boundaries. So the greatest volume of magma is produced along the oceanic ridge system. So this is where the lithosphere is being pulled apart. So we have less confining pressure. Confining is pressure in all directions. Um, so partial melting of the mantle rocks is occurring because releasing confining pressure lowers the melting temperature. And we have large quantities of basaltic magma that are produced. So not all spreading centers are going to be located along the axis of an oceanic ridge system. Now we also get intraplate igneous activity. So activity within a rigid plate. So we will have plumes of hot mantle material that ascend towards the surface. These form localized volcanic regions called hot spots. Um, and this can be associated with our Hawaiian Islands. So for more information on all of this, check out the video link below. All right, for next steps, please complete lab five, our viscosity lab, and do reading quiz number five. Now lab five, you're gonna need some corn syrups. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to contact me um, and start on lab five early. All right, thank you.